All right, I'm thinking we can get started with this one. So Brain Computer right. Interface by Prith, take it away. Solid. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Hope you guys have had a very informative day. Now let's get started with Brain Computer Interfaces. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is our human brain. So I think the brain is arguably the most important part of us being human. So in this picture, you see three species on this planet, the humans, the dogs, and the cats. We've been here for the last 200, 300,000 years, and humans have become the apex species on this planet. So why did that happen? I think brain, our most important organ, has, been, has played a huge part in making us humans the biggest species on this planet. Our ability to communicate has made us stronger and smarter. So if you look past the past 200,000 years of evolution, the human evolution, we have uh, mastered the art of dividing work. And so the ability to just simply say, hey, I am going to go get some food and you can cook it. Simply the division of that labor allowed us to conserve our energy and focus on more important things. And so that allowed us to form groups, which allowed us to make bigger groups. And as you can see in this GIF, we just became bigger and bigger. And that's how we have the civilization we have now. Communication was key. And so you all know Harari has a really good book called Sapiens. Uh, you guys should definitely check it out if you're interested in human evolution and how to become the greatest species on this planet. So let's talk about the brain. So human brain is located in the skull and contains billions of nerve cells or neurons, which allow us to operate day to day. These neurons are key to life and are key to whatever we do, to us seeing, touching stuff, and doing all the other things that we do day to day. What are neurons? So neurons are essentially tiny cells that help transmit electrical signals from the brain to different parts of the body. You get the electrical signals into the dendrites, through the axon, to the terminal junctions, to the next dendrite. And so what happens is your brain creates these signals and they go through nerve cells to the end of your body and then back. A lot of these functions have evolved to become automatic and manual, as we'll see next. The brain can be divided into main major three parts, which are the cerebrum, which is also the largest part of the brain, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. So the cerebrum essentially takes care of a lot of the touch, vision, a lot of the human senses, reasoning, emotion, learning. Then we have the cerebellum, which is a lot of physical aspects, such as muscle coordination, movement, postures, balance. And then we have the brainstem, which controls a lot of the automatic things. And so like your heart rate, your breathing, body temperature, these three major parts essentially do all the functions that we need to survive. And so you see brains and you see all these wrinkles. And so wrinkles increase the surface area of your brain, which, increasing, which increases your processing power. If you're looking at a brain with a lot of wrinkles, they have higher processing power. And so when we talk about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, doctors are, or papers are usually talking about the cerebrum. So the left hemisphere is a lot of analytical, logical, and detailed stuff, while the right hemisphere is a lot of creative, imaginative, and empathetic stuff. And your right hemisphere controls your left side of the body, and your left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. Pretty interesting how that came to happen with the way evolution has worked out. And so if you look at the smaller, smaller regions in your brain, you can divide them into different lobes, like the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe, and the frontal lobe. And then other parts like the basal ganglia, thalamus, and then hypothalamus, and the cerebellum and brainstem. So there's a lot of different functions at a lot of different parts of the brain where all of that happens. So location of where these things happen is really important when you talk about the brain computer interfaces, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. Coming back to the brainstem, the brainstem is a is the essentially the connecting portion between our brain and our body. And so the nervous system can be divided into two parts in our body. So one's the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, which is everything other than these two. And so what happens is the brain sends the signals to the spinal cord. And from the spinal cord, there's nerves extending into your body. And that's how the signals reach to the different corners of your body. This is key uh, information. 
electrical signals are traveling across your body all the time. And then now we'll see a TED talk that Greg Gates taught, uh, conducted in 2015 and how he makes use of these electrical signals. The brain is an amazing and complex organ. And while many people are fascinated by the brain, they can't really tell you that much about the properties about how the brain works because we don't teach neuroscience in schools. And one of the reasons why is that the equipment is so complex and so expensive that it's really only done at major universities and large institutions. Uh, and so in order to be able to access the brain, you really need to you know, dedicate your life and spend six and a half years as a graduate student, just become a neuroscientist, get access to these tools. And that's a shame because one out of five of us, that's 20% of the entire world will have a neurological disorder. And there are zero cures for these diseases. And so it seems that what we should be doing is sort of reaching back earlier in the education process and sort of teaching students about neuroscience and so that in the future they may be thinking about possibly becoming a brain scientist. And so when I was a graduate student, my lab mate, Tim Marzullo and myself decided that, you know, what if we took this complex equipment that we have for studying the brain and made it simple enough and affordable enough that anyone, uh, you know, an amateur or a high school student uh, could learn and actually participate in the discovery of neuroscience. And so we did just that. A few years ago, we started a company called Backyard Brains, and we make DIY neuroscience equipment. And uh, I brought some here tonight, and I want to uh, do some demonstrations. You guys want to see some? All right. All right, so I need a volunteer. Uh, so right before, what is, what is your name? Sam. All right, Sam. Uh, I'm going to record from your brain. Have you, have you had this before? No. Okay, all right. I need you to stick out your arm for science. Roll up your sleeve a bit, all right. And so what I'm gonna do, I'm putting electrodes on your arm and you're probably wondering, I just said I'm gonna record from your brain, what am I doing with your arm? Uh, well, we, you have about 80 billion neurons inside your brain right now. They're sending electrical messages back and forth and chemical messages. Uh, but some of your neurons in, right here in your motor cortex are gonna send messages down when you move your arm like this. They go down across your corpus callosum, down onto your spinal cord, your lower motor neuron, out to your muscles here, and that is electrical discharge. It's gonna be picked up by these uh, electrodes right here, and we're gonna be able to listen to exactly what your brain is gonna be doing. So I'm gonna turn this on for a second. Have you ever heard what your brain sounds like? No. All right, let's turn it on. So go ahead, whenever you, go ahead and squeeze your hand. All right, so what you're listening to, so this is your motor units that are happening right here. Okay, so let's take a look at it as well. So I'm gonna stand over here. I'm gonna open up our app here. So now I want you to squeeze. Yeah, so right here, these are the motor units that are happening from her spinal cord out to her muscle right here. And as she's doing it, you're seeing the electrical activity that's happening here. We can even click here and try to see one of them. So keep doing it really, really hard. Yeah, so now we've paused on one motor axe potential that's happening right now inside of your brain. Okay, uh, do you guys wanna do see some more? All right. That's interesting, but let's get it better. Okay, uh, I need one more volunteer. Okay, what is your name, sir? Miguel. Miguel, all right. Um, you're gonna stand right here. So Miguel, when you're moving your arm like this, your brain is sending a signal down to your muscles right here. Uh, I want you to move your arm as well. All right, so your brain is gonna send a, like, a signal down to your muscles. And so it turns out that there is a, a nerve that's right here that runs up here that innervates these three fingers uh, and is close enough to the skin that we might be able to stimulate that so that we can do is copy your brain signal that's going out to your hand and inject it into your hand so that your hand will move when your brain tells your hand to move. And so in a sense, she will take away your free will and you will no longer have any control over this hand, okay? You with me? All right, so I just need to hook you up. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna find your ulmer nerve, which is probably right around here. You don't know what you're signing up for when you come up and... <laughs> so now I'm going to move away and I'm going to plug it into our human-to-human -human interface over here. Okay, so Sam wants you to uh, squeeze your hand again. All right, do it again. All right, perfect. So now I'm going to hook you up over here so that you get the... It's going to feel a little bit weird at first. This is going to feel like a... <laughs> 
you know, when you lose your free will uh, and someone else becomes your agent, it does feel a bit strange. So I want you to relax your hand. All right, and Sam, you're with me. All right, so you're gonna you're gonna squeeze. I'm not gonna turn it on yet. So go ahead and give it a squeeze. All right. So now, are you ready, Miguel? Ready as I'll ever be. Okay. So I've turned it on. So go ahead and turn your hand. Uh, do you feel that a little bit? No. Okay. Do it again. No. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. So relax. No, do, hit it again. Okay. <laughs> Oh, perfect, perfect. All right, so relax, do it again. All right, so now... <laughs> All right, so right now, your brain is controlling your arm, and it's also controlling his arm. So go ahead and just do it one more time. All right, so that's perfect. <laughs> so now, what would happen if I took over my control of your, your hand, and so just relax your hand, what happens? Ah, nothing. Why not? Because the brain has to do it. Now, you do it again. All right, that's perfect. <laughs> so isn't that a really cool experiment? So what he does is he uses these electrodes and puts them on the arm. And he uses the electrodes to measure the electric signals to then control it. So that's what BCIs try to do. What we're trying to do is, direct, is create a direct communication pathway from the brain to an external device. So the electrodes, instead of going on the arm, go directly in the brain to then control different stuff. So that's BCI. So let's see how it works. First off, you need to measure electronic signals. So as I mentioned, the electrodes, instead of going into the arm to measure these signals, these electrodes would go into the brain to measure the electronic signals. So now that you've measured them, you have to decode the signals. You need to figure out where the signals are coming from and what those are. And then you need to encode them into meaningful action. So when you're measuring these signals, you need to figure out what that signal means, right? That like you need to know if it's coming from your, uh, you know, your hunger emotion, or it's coming from your vision, or it's coming from your noise, smell. So you need to figure out meaningful action, a meaning to these signals. And then you need to send them to an external device. So measure them, find a meaning to what those signals mean, and then send it to an external device, which could be a prosthetic arm, which could be a computer game, a phone, or whatever. How do you measure these signals? So there's three ways you can measure these electronic signals. There's the invasive BCI, partially invasive, and non-invasive. So with invasive, what happens is the electrodes go directly into the brain. So you need surgery to put these electrodes inside the brain. And there's partially invasive, where these electrodes go on top of the brain. So it's like a Band-Aid on your brain. And then there's the non-invasive, which don't require any surgery, and you just wear a helmet so it goes on top of your skull to then measure the electrical signals through like an electromagnetic field. And so how do you do that? So you use EEGs, which are electroencephalograph. Yeah, so they're commonly used to measure brain activity. You see this lady here wearing this helmet, and you see these different electrodes that are placed on the helmet, and so these are the signals that are coming from that helmet. It's really hard to tell what these signals mean, right? There's a big challenge to figure out what each of these signals mean and what they pertain, what information they pertain. Location of the signal is important. So let's say you put an electrode which is closer to the occipital lobe over here. And so we know that the signal that's coming from the occipital lobe actually means that the signal that we're getting is related to vision. So it's related to the light that's being sensed by your eyes. And so when you get these signals, you need to figure out these differences. So we need to find and relate the patterns that are provided in these waves and find these different patterns and differences and the location. And using these two factors, we can figure out what that signal means. And that's a big challenge that people are trying to solve right now. And uh, we'll see where we are. When we talk about these signals, so every person has a different brain. Has, and like, you know, the signals that come from each brain are also different. So if I say play music, but if somebody else says play music, like their signals are going to be similar, but not same. Similarly, if I just say play music, or if I say play Post Malone, then these signals are going to be similar, but not exactly same. So we need to figure out a method to differentiate these signals so that if we connect it to an external device, the external device can play the, you know, can function the proper command. The best example is these uh, smart AIs that we have in our homes. So when I say, Alexa, turn on the lamp, 
some engineer had to sit down and like type it in, right? That, hey, if somebody says, Alexa, turn off the lamp, then you have to turn off this specific lamp. And so engineers, software developers, everybody has been sitting for the last 15, 20 years and coding all this stuff down. That's how we have voice recognition. But for brains, we need to be able to measure all of these electrical signals and figure out how and what signal means what function. So that command to function relation that we have for these smart devices, we have to make them for electrical signals. That's how BCIs in general work. And let's see the real applications that we've seen now. Alvin Lucier created the first ever proper real life application in 1965. So he actually wore this headband, which was connected to these different instruments. So whatever he taught, these electrical signals that he generated were recorded in the band, amplified through the wires, and then went to the instrument to make a noise. And so it wasn't exactly music, but it was an art performance for uh, BCIs. And recently in 2008, we had in University of Pittsburgh, Professor Andrew Short's lab actually created a robotic arm. And so they trained the monkey to control the robotic arm to grab this candy and feed it to itself. The monkey only used electrical impulses of his brain to feed itself. But all of that apparatus is, a, is huge, right? You need to measure all these things. And so non-invasive BCIs are pretty difficult. So you need to have this helmet, you need to have all these electrodes plugged into a computer, and you need to measure all these things. So they're not really good for commercial application. Like you can't really wear those and go shopping to Walmart or something, right? Invasive methods are better for commercial applications. So what those are is essentially putting in electrodes directly into the brain. And if these electrodes are so close, they also provide high sensitivity and accuracy. Neuralink is a company by Elon Musk that's actually spearheading the invasive BCI product sector, and they're hoping to commercialize in the next couple of years. They made this chip that has these electrodes connected to them, and these electrodes then go into the brain and then measure the electrical signals. And they actually released this video yesterday, and I really uh, want you guys to watch it. It's pretty insane what they can do with these electrodes. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. He's learned to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. Neurons in this region modulate their activity with intended hand movement. For example, some might become more active when he moves his hand up and others when he moves it to the right. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict Page's intended hand movements in real time. First, we calibrate the decoder by recording neural activity as Pager uses the joystick to move a cursor to targets presented on the screen. As he's playing this game, we are wirelessly streaming in real time the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, 
Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. He's focused and he's playing entirely of his own volition. It's not magic. The reason Neuralink works is because it's recording and decoding electrical signals from the brain. Great game, Pager. And what better reward for a monkey than a banana? So isn't that super cool? They're legit getting a monkey to play games with his mind directly. So imagine in the next five years, you could play your PS4 or Switch or any game you want directly through your brain. You wouldn't need to use your fingers or legs or anything. And so that's where we come in. So you, you heard how they put almost 2,000 electrodes in the monkey's brain. That's what we work on. So we work on manufacturing high-density neural interfaces. So our project mainly focuses on increasing the density of these electrodes so that they can be inserted into the monkey brain or our brains later on. Uh, safely and provide high accuracy. These things are really, really tiny. So our hair is actually 100 microns thick on average, and the pillars that we print are almost 30 microns. So they're a third of the thickness of our human hair. You can see how when we try to take pictures, we need to use these really long, tiny lenses to take pictures of our sample. And how do we print these really tiny samples? So what we do is we use a 3D aerosol jet printer. So that's a big, humongous machine that allows us to drop micro droplets, which are about 10 to 50 microns on top of each other. So we kind of just stack drops on top of each other and then heat them simultaneously so that we form a pillar. And so these pillars, because we're just putting droplets, it becomes so tiny and so thin that these are you know, uh, usable for brain interfaces. This is an example of how we print stuff. And so this is the printer dropper. And so it essentially drops tiny, tiny droplets onto the substrate and then creates these colors and different designs, whatever we need for the experiment. I'm sure you've heard of concussions. So when humans are walking around and they fall, the skull actually, the brain moves inside the skull. So the brain is not attached. It's like kind of just floating in a fluid. And so what happens is when you fall, your brain kind of shakes and hits the skull. Imagine you're having these BCIs, these electrodes in your brains, and you fall, and then the, the electrode just breaks. So you don't want like a random piece of metal stuck in your brain, right? A big aspect of what we do in our lab is to make sure these electrodes are strong so that when, you know, if something like this, someone falls or the brain shakes, the electrodes don't break. So some things we do is like, let's say, for example, this is a sample. We try to do insertion tests. So this is something called an agarose gel. So it essentially mimics the brain. And so we try to insert it in the gel, pull it out, try to shake it, and make sure that these electrodes are strong to be inserted into you know, a brain. Main focuses go on the size of the electrode, the sensitivity of the electrode, and the strength. So you want to make sure that they're small enough strong enough and can measure the tiniest electrical signals in the brain. And so we test them on agarose gels and also sometimes on mouse brains. So we get to work with biological labs where they try to do surgeries and then try to insert these chips into mouse brains and then see how they work out. BCIs hey, could really help with... Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a question in chat. I think it related to just their last couple of slides. Um, the question was, what if it cuts the brain? Yeah, so because these, uh, so as I showed you before, oh wait. Ah. So these are really small electrodes, right? And so when we put these in, they usually just go straight in. And because the brain is so dense, there's really not any chance for the electrodes to move. And so that's why they don't really, cut, you know, they don't really move a lot in the brain itself. So unless your brain shakes aggressively, 
it doesn't break and it doesn't cut. And the way these structures are made, they're also specifically smoothened out so that it doesn't hurt your brain. You know, it's only meant to go inside and measure the electrical signals and not hurt it. And because these are so tiny, even if it hurts it, it's not like it won't be a life threatening problem. You know, it'll be like a really tiny sting. Some of the applications I wanted to talk about were so with BCIs, we could really help out with uh, getting a better understanding of mental illnesses. We could, people who have lost their senses, so like their touch, hearing, or sight, we could use the BCIs to re energize the neurons and record impulses that weren't being recorded before to give people their senses back. Handicapped people could really use it. Uh, so as the video mentioned, the Neuralink video, they're trying to get the BCIs to be used by paralysis, people affected by paralysis and get their body to, you know, their body functions to start again. And it'll be even helpful for prosthetics because if we have uh, neuro-connected prosthetics, these can be directly controlled from the brain and it'll be a lot more accurate and a lot more smooth operation. And it's not just for medicine either. So with just normal stuff, you could imagine just unlimited, anything you could do with these BCIs. You could drive a car, you could use your phone, you could have an AI in bolt in your head. You could just close your eyes and play a VR game. I don't know if you guys have seen, but in Matrix, there's a scene where they install Kung Fu in Keanu Reeves' brain. So imagine a future where you're sitting in class and you want to study something and you can just plug and play, just download it into your brain, your math textbook, science textbook, any movie or anything. This technology is highly, it's, it's developing rapidly. And I'm sure in the next 15 to 20 years, it will be a commercially cheap available technology that all of us can have. And we are in the right place in time um, in human technology where we can work on this and we can make it possible. So you guys can definitely get started working on BCIs and you know help make this a reality. I know we don't have a lot of question, uh, time for questions, but I hope you guys learned something. And may, maybe I can answer one question if anyone has. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. I hope you guys learned something.